Welcome back to Retro Depot. Today we're back with another installment of the um, Digital Logic series. We're going to be taking a look at several different things today. Um, this is the fourth video in the series. And we're going to look at how to put all the little pieces together. Um, and we're also going to take a look at um, a couple little gotchas that uh, digital has in store for you once you actually get into Quartus software, uh, possibly other uh, variants of um, uh, FPGA software. And we're also going to be taking a look at some short snippets of VHDL code. Uh, the purpose behind this is sometimes you need to describe something that is going to be more difficult to um, more difficult to lay out in a schematic than it would be to just simply describe the uh, circuit itself. So we're going to jump right in here in just a moment, but you might pause the video and take a uh, short trip to the kitchen, get you something to drink, because we are going to be here for just a minute, as you can tell by the previous three videos. Um, I'm trying to go into as much detail with these as I can in order to uh, give you a good idea as far as some of the things that you will need to do when designing um, you know, hardware from software. Um, it's a little bit different way of doing things. You know, mostly we break out the breadboard or we break out uh, perf board and you know we kind of design it up, draw it on uh, you know paper. But we can actually simulate things with this, so it's a little bit different way of going about it. But anyways, I'm going to give you just a short second here to go ahead and um, get you something to drink or something to eat. Sit back, watch video, and if you got any questions, be sure and post them below. Okay, we are back and we are going to take a look at some components. So in the previous uh, videos I showed you how to build uh, circuits. Well, the great thing about digital is once you have those circuits built you can go to um, components and you can pull up these components and you can uh, just drag and drop them right into the circuit here. And this is really handy because one of the things that this allows you to do is to um, implement these circuits into a larger schematic. And you can even open these up by right clicking and um, once you right click at that point you can uh, pull up the schematic. This is the one that we did in the first video, the mapper. But today we are not so much worried about uh, the uh, individual components as we are bringing them together into something that's a little bit more um, a little bit more I guess you could say user-friendly uh, something that we can import into Quartus and actually use as a basis for our uh, digital software or digital hardware so here is one that I have already pre-built and as you can see there's not a lot to it there's just two components here that we built in uh, previous videos uh, well they're similar they're not the same components but we've stuck them here and we've essentially wired up our pins and wired up the commons and everything else is one that's going um, in and out so this version of the mapper that I have is one that's quite a bit more complex so if we take a look at it you can see there's a lot more stuff going on here and the reason for that is is this is actually an 8 megabyte mapper and it also has the ability to uh, read that data out um, it's got the same latches here for the address or um, or for the I'm sorry the SRAM or the ROM so we've got a little bit more going on but for the most part it's very similar in its nature um, it's very 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 similar in design and uh, the other one that we have here is um, an IO decoder and as you can tell this one is also very similar uh, major difference is, is that uh, the IO addressing is a little bit different we've got a couple flip-flops in here to be able to provide some latches we've got a, a weight state generator for a video uh, processor as well as a um, octal latch here to um, essentially be able to write data onto a stable bus that 
other components may need in order to um, actually read the data. For example, the keyboard and the um, um, the keyboard and the video controller. And we'll go into more details about that um, here in a little bit. But this is not too different. As you can tell, we can go in here and this is just an octal latch with a clear. We have a um, flip-flop register with um, set and reset. Um, you know, our basic I.O. decoding here, we have a uh, flip-flop here and we can simulate all this if we wanted to. There's no point in doing that at the moment. But the point that I'm getting at is these are not the same components that we used last time, but they are very, very similar. And uh, the reason why I wanted to use uh, something similar to this is because I'm actually in the process of working on a new project myself, um, a larger board, and um, you'll be seeing that in a future video. It's still a, a couple revisions out from really being ready to do any type of videos on. Um, I'm, I'm to the point to where the hardware is designed, um, the uh, at, the CPLD is for the most part designed, but none of the software is, and I need to get it put together and start playing with it and seeing if I can get it to actually work. So it's a work in progress. But I just wanted to take a few minutes and show this to you so that we have a pretty good idea as far as the types of components that we're going to be using. Now, something else that you might occasionally need is a clock source. And I'm going to actually add one here. Um, let me see if I've got it. Hmm, I may not have it. I don't think I do. We'll take a look at that um, whenever we bring up Quartus because I've got the actual um, export. But uh, essentially any time that you're doing something like this, um, you're going to need a clock source. And with uh, this particular computer, we've got a bunch of stuff going on. As you can see, we've got um, uh, video select lines, we've got uh, keyboard column, so we've got chip selects for various different things. We've got data out ports with data enable lines, um, um, uh, address pin expansions, as well as a ROM and a RAM select on the inputs, pretty much what you would expect uh, given our previous videos, reset, set, uh, memory request, IO request, read write, A15, A14, um, A7 through A0, and D0 uh, through D7. But I also have this video acknowledge that's for the um, uh, video, one of the video uh, generation um, chips that we're going to use in this build. Now that said, um, once you have it built, the question then becomes, how do you export this into something that's usable by Quartus? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, it's pretty simple. You're just going to go to File, and you're going to go to Export, and then Export to VHDL. And it's going to give you a location um, that you can save in, just like saving a file from you know, a text editor. And that takes care of 90% of the work that you have to do. Now, the two things that you do want to do is, first off, under circuit sp uh, specific settings, you want to come in here and you want to adjust the width. So you can adjust you know, how wide this thing is. I'm going to set it to 12. The color, you can give it a description, um, which I highly suggest that you do. Um, give yourself some information that way when you're using this. In the VHDL code that it exports, it will have this description in it, and that will let you know the specifics about the chip that you're using. That way, in case you forget, you can go back and reference those. And actually, I'm going to pull this up because I want you to see this. So if I come in here and open up this memory mapper, and I go and I go to the circuit-specific settings, it gives me all the information that I've written about how this works. That's very important because I don't want to forget that information later on. And that's exactly what you should do. You should put this information in there so that you can use it. Now, um, once you've got your code exported, then the next thing that you need to do is obviously open it up into Quartus. But not everybody knows how to use Quartus. There's a lot of newbies among us, myself being one of them, to be clear. I've worked with Quartus just enough to know the very 
bare minimum. Um, I'm by no means an expert. I do not write in VHDL very much. Um, I don't really understand VHDL very well. Um, it's just not my thing. I prefer to be able to design in schematics. But there are some things that we need to use VHDL for. So what we're going to do next is we are actually going to open up Cordis and we are going to take a look at um, the software and how to put these pieces that we've designed here together with other pieces. Okay, so we'll be right back and we're going to show you how to use Cordis software. Okay, so this is the Cordis software. I'm using the 32-bit version just for simplicity. Um, not everybody is going to have a 64-bit machine. And uh, this particular version that I'm using is the 13.01 or 0 .0 which is um, the you know Cordis 2 uh, version 13 service pack one is essentially what this is. I don't know if you can still f download this. I think they've taken it down off the website. However, there are still some places that you can scrounge this up from. The reason why you want to use this particular version of the software is because it is one of the last versions that um, st I, I think it is the last version that supports both the um, Cyclone 2 as well as the Max 7000 series which as we mentioned earlier we are going to be using the Max um, uh, 7000 series uh, CPLD for this project specifically EPM 7128 uh, um, 84 pin PLLC or PLCC or whatever it is you know what I'm talking about so once we've got this brought up we need to open up um, or w really we need to uh, start a new um, uh, project so we're gonna go to file and we are going to go to new project wizard and this diagram box is gonna pop up we're gonna go next we're gonna set our folder which I'm got my folder right here I'm just gonna call this G8099 because that's kind of the board that I'm working on at the moment and then w once we get to here we can actually add um, we can add uh, files so if we bring it up it's gonna pop up of course we can go to the desktop and we can go here and we can add in whatever we want so I'm actually going to add in a few files right here. I've got my combined uh, logic that I did earlier that I exported. I've got a clock generator and a baud generator. And I'm going to go ahead and open those up. And it's going to add those right here. And of course, it kind of, the software is a little bit old and it doesn't really f work well with the newer Windows APIs, but you can adjust everything and kind of see what it's saying. But now that we have our code in there that we're going to be using, and of course you can add more code later but you're going to click next and once you do you're going to end up with uh, page three of five now we already know that we're going to be using a max 7000 series and specifically the slc 84 so we're going to go ahead and open this up now this is one very irritating um, aspect of this software one version allows you to adjust the height of this which ultimately increases the height of this little scroll window right here by dragging right here up i think it's a 64-bit version but either way they should have added a tab here or something that way you can open this up a little bit wider and see what you're needing but we'll figure it out so the epm 7128 uh, slc 84 is what we're going to be using um, so we just need to scroll down until we see it. Okay, so SLC 84, and we're going to go with the 15 because that's the sl slowest version, I believe. Yeah. So this is the one that we're going to select. Now, you can actually uh, narrow it down with these options here. But if you know what part number you've got, there's no point. The reason why I'm using this is because the core voltage is 5 volt. And uh, of course, it's a larger one. It does have 128 macro cells. But once you've selected your part, then you're going to click next. 
I'm not going to go into this stuff. Uh, really, there are plenty of videos out there talking about Quartus software. Uh, if you want to know about what these things do and how you can use them, go refer to that or those videos out there. Like I said, there's plenty of tutorials. But once you've uh, clicked past that, you get to page five of five, and it gives you the bare necessities here that you need. Um, none of this really matters other than just making sure that our project directory is in the right location, that we have a named project name, uh, we have our correct device selected, and that's pretty much it. So now it's going to start a new project. And the only thing that you probably notice that changed is it threw up this information up here. Well, there's lots of little tabs here that you can go to, but realistically, the one that you're probably going to spend the most amount of time on is the Files tab. Okay? And this is where you're going to do a lot of your work. Now, before we get too deep into how to uh, get these files ready to add into your designs, we need to talk about VHDL. So if we actually go and take a look at this mapper, here and we take a look at the code that it generated it's not going to be the most readable thing in the world um, you know it's labeling entities as you know FF registers and uh, you know it's got if else statements and um, lots of signals here that may not make any sense to you and that's fine because 99% of the time you're not going to know what this stuff is um, it, at least not whenever you've built it the way that we've built it in these videos. Now, if you were designing this from scratch, you would need to know every single thing about this. But the reason why I'm talking to you about VHDL is because you are going to run into a problem with digital. Digital does not take into consideration um, uh, double negatives. And what I mean by that, and you'll see once I actually go to compile this, if you have a not or a not input that is going to give you a not output, it will not give you just a, um, a, a regular high state output. It tries to double not those. And when it comes to VHDL, at least in Quartus, it does not like that one bit. Not at all. It, matter of fact, it hates it. It's not even going to compile. And I'm going to show that to you right now. So the first thing that we have to do to get this stuff ready to add into our um, um, FPGA or CPLD, so we want to right-click and create AHDL include files for current file. And it's going to chug along doing its thing. And you're going to end up seeing this error create include file was successful and that actually should not be the case let me pause the video for just a moment okay I'm back now I'm not sure if this is going to actually uh, be successful but um, we're gonna go ahead and try to run these one more time and if yeah there we go so we're gonna get that error and uh, it's basically telling you that we've got a problem so if we look at this it's saying that specifically at mapper uh, v3 which is the VHDL file that I added in I actually removed the combined one and added this one in because I know for a fact that this one has this error and it's generated by digital but it's saying near text not expecting a, a bracket or an identifier and it says that the include file was unsuccessful. Now, if we actually go over here and double click on this, it'll take us to that part of the code. But we are going to scroll down just a little bit with this and take a look at exactly what it's talking about. This right here is what it's talking about. And also right here. Now, a not means um, basically the inverse and essentially what this statement is saying is the inverse of the inverse of some value and if we have two negatives they cancel each other out which make it a positive which means that we need to delete that okay 
and the same thing over here we need to just go ahead and get rid of this and by doing that now we can actually create this include file so yes we do want to save our changes now our include file was successful that's a got you okay that right there is going to cause you a major problem when it comes to putting this software together you're going to have a horrible time building this if you um, aren't able to track that down it's pretty straightforward once you figure out what it is that it's talking to you about but whenever I first started to compile these it threw me off I didn't know what I was looking for and then it just occurred to me hey there's two knots here they just cancel each other out I need to essentially get rid of them and I tried it and sure enough it worked fine so that's something to pay attention to okay so now we've gotten our um, original file back I've already included uh, or I've done the include file the next thing we want to do is create the system files or the symbol files for the current file so we're gonna go ahead and run that and of course this takes a little bit of time as well but it jumps up and says it's, it's successful so that's pretty quick now the next thing I want to talk about and I mentioned before um, clocks so one of the biggest problems with building a computer a lot of times is the multiple clocks um, clocks that you have to have and I've got this clock generator here that I um, used uh, digital in order to create and essentially what it does is it takes a 24 megahertz clock or it could take any frequency really but it divides it by two it divides it by three and it divides it by four and it gives me uh, three outputs and of course I have those um, listed right there but sometimes you're gonna have to be able to generate a baud signal um, a baud clock for a serial port or something along those lines and with this particular system I need a total of I think it's six clocks if I'm not mistaken um, I need a system clock I need a uh, 12 megahertz clock for a, a USB port I need a 8 megahertz clock for um, a SAA 1099 sound generator and I also need a baud clock of um, you know some uh, frequency that's compatible with serial ports now in addition to that I need two other clock frequencies one of them is for a VDP uh, which is going to be around 10 megahertz and I need a uh, l the last one is actually a 16 megahertz clock for an AVR so I need a variety of clocks and the problem that you're going to run into with any type of hardware whenever you need that many clocks is that it gets expensive in one way or the other you're either going to use a lot of board space creating clock generators you're going to spend a lot of money on um, uh, you know exo oscillators or a combination of both and that creates issues with space it creates issues where you've got a lot of money going towards just a few components because those oscillators can cost anywhere between two to ten dollars a piece you know for the typical ones that people are going to use um, but if you need six of them you know you're talking about what is that anywhere between fifteen to twenty five dollars for your bill of materials just for your clocks that's unreasonable so a better approach is to use a single clock and actually use the CPLD to divide that clock down into usable segments. So the first thing that I did here was I actually created a clock generator. It takes 24 megahertz clock and it basically divides it by two, divides it by three, and divides it by four. And by doing that, I get a 12 megahertz for my USB, get eight megahertz for my uh, audio, and I get six megahertz for my system clock but I still need something else and that's baud clock um, the other two the 10 megahertz and the 16 megahertz they've got um, you know um, clock generators built into the chips you know they've got a um, invert uh, inverter on the inside all you really need is a crystal and two caps but with baud rate I don't have a commonly divisible um, uh, amount here so I need to do some work in order to essentially divide that 24 megahertz clock down into something that's more usable specifically I wanted to keep this low frequency because of several reasons first off 9600 baud is kind of it's kind of become the standard go-to for 
uh, the hobbyists. Um, you know, let's be frank. You know, most people that are going to be serious about computers are probably going to use something a little bit more high speed. But for the everyday person, they're probably going to choose that default 9600 baud. And it also, in this particular case, it slows down the uh, serial port enough that we can use things like our improvised UART that we did in the last video. So I needed to come up with a way of creating a baud clock. And the way I decided to do that is actually in VHDL. And the reason why I chose VHDL is because for this particular application, it's actually easier to design it in VHDL than it would be to try to create a schematic. And the reason why I say that is because this, we're trying to count an uneven amount of counts in order to come up with a uh, frequency. Surely we could count, or we could uh, create some type of counter that, uh, you know, counted half the frequency and then, you know, it uh, flipped a bit on each uh, time it reached its limit. That's certainly possible, but the reality is, is that for something like this, it's just easier to describe it. Save yourself a lot of headache. Trust me, I tried. I wanted to be able to do it in digital. I tried. I did try it several times. I got nowhere close to where I got whenever I just um, decided to describe it. So this is a very, very short piece of code. Um, 38 lines total including five lines well you know six lines there for the little header you know a couple other lines here and there but essentially you know what we're doing is we're describing the entity which is a baud generator we're giving it an input port of clock and its standard logic and an output port of the baud clock as far as the architecture is concerned um, we've got two variables a baud uh, temporary file or temporary storage and then a baud count we actually set what that range is and of course I've got the math up here for that so uh, it divides the clock by 1250 times 2 so you can see 0 to 1250 and that creates a 9600 baud from a 24 megahertz um, um, oscillator if you want to do the math on it and double check me that's perfectly fine but if you take uh, 24 million I think that's what it is 24 million yeah and you divide by 1250 you get uh, 1920 so that's probably not right hold on oh we messed up it's actually gonna be um, 2500 because it's the 1250 times 2 so 24 million divided by 2500 equals 9600 even so yep that's right so that's what we're doing here and then um, basically we're just um, counting and we're setting the variables here as they need to be and then once the process is ended the baud clock is basically going to equal the baud uh, temp count or temp value so pretty simple but that's an easy way to create a baud rate from a given clock source and you're not always going to be on point with this whenever I tested this against my oscilloscope which is not necessarily the most accurate when it comes to frequency counting it came out at 9,592 uh, was the uh, uh, you know uh, kilohertz so 9.592 kilohertz so it was pretty close it, it, it basically within 0.1 percent I think so that's good enough for the girls I go with. Um, now the next thing that we need to talk about is actually taking these files and putting them in some type of usable format. So while it may seem weird, now we're going to create another schematic. So we have to create a new file and we are going to want to put a block diagram or a schematic file in here. It's going to pop up. We want to save this. So save as. And we're just going to call it g99.bdf. And now this is the part where we get to actually put things in here. So we are going to insert a symbol. It's going to pop up with this box. We're going to choose project and then main. And by choosing main, it's got our main little. Um, uh, 
combinational decoder and mapper in here. Now, scroll out. Now, there's got to be a lot of pins on this that I'm not going to connect because, uh, let's face it, don't really need to to show you how to do this. Um, this right here is not going to be something I'm actually going to use. Uh, we'll go into that later on, but we're just going to pop some pins up here. I'm going to delete these um, pins here on the data outlines because that's actually going to be too many pins for this particular package. So we're going to get rid of these, and of course I can scroll down like that and just delete them. So now we got these up here. The next thing that we want to do is we want to, before we do anything else, before we assign any pins or anything, we want to go up here and click this pin here, or this button. It's the start compilation. And it's going to ask us if we want to save it. We want to click yes. And it's going to go through here and it's going to add all this stuff up and it's going to tell us how many macro cells we've used and whether or not it was successful and all that good jazz. So we actually look like we've got eight warnings here and of course we can stretch this up and take a look at these warnings. Uh, all this stuff here you can ignore. We can ignore those two because we don't care. It's not breaking the system. Um, may want to take a look at them later on. And we got two more here. That doesn't matter and that doesn't matter either. So, okay. We're good to go. Actually, we'll click all. All right. So we used 64 macro cells, which is exactly half of the internals of our CPLD. And we have used a total of 58 pins. Um, we've got a total of 68, but remember, you will not be able to use four of these pins. And I will show you why in just a second, because it's going to really upset you. You think you got 64 pins, but you or 68 pins, but you really don't. You've only got 64, and that's something that you need to keep in mind. So we're going to go up here, and we're going to click this pin planner. Now, let me shrink this back down so that we can actually get everything in this window here. All right, so this is our pin planner, and this is where you get to assign pins. And you can do all kinds of fancy stuff. So, for an example, you can actually uh, reserve this pin as bidirectional, input tri-stated, output driving an unspecified signal, or output driving VCC, so on and so forth. We're not really caring about that. But this is where we actually get to go and plug these in. Now, I mentioned before that you only get 64 out of the 68 pins. And the reason for that being is that pin 14, pin 23, pin 62, and pin 71 are used. And what I mean by that is, is that these four signals here, you're going to want to have them added. Because if you don't add them and you assign them to something else, you are going to find yourself in a very sore position whenever you go to reprogram this after your chip doesn't work the way it was intended to and you find out that you've been locked out of your chip. What I mean by that is is sort of like with an AVR microcontroller if you uh, reassign the reset pin to some other given value you need a high um, you know voltage programmer in order to reset it so that you can actually go and program it again and with the Max 7000 series EPLDs. If you can't use JTAG, there's only one other way to do it, and it's parallel. And the problem is, is that even to this day, after all my searching, I still cannot find A, the schematics, or B, the algorithms for programming these. If you got an old school processor, probably sometime back in the late 90s, it may have a uh, port for this. If you do, please contact me because I have questions. But if you do not have this, then you're going to be in a position where there's only one thing that you can do with that chip. And it's throw it away because you're done. You're never using it again. Okay. So this one basically tells us it's pin 62. So we are going to assign it there. TDI tells us it's 14. So we are going to assign it here. TDO tells us it's 71. So we are going to give it that. And the last one is... Uh, TMS which is 23 and um, that's it so that's all we need to worry about with that
Now the rest of these you're going to go through here and of course it doesn't matter where, where these things are at. Um, we're going to sign A there, um, B there. The X's means that they're not available. Those are power pins is what those are. Um, our clock inputs are up here, 83 and 82. I think that there's some way to use system clocks with this CPLD and with the software, but I don't know how to do it, so I'm not going to guess. But anyways, you're just going to go through here and you're going to assign your pins to whatever place. It doesn't really matter where, uh, you know, you'll figure that out once you're designing your system. But once you're done, you're just going to close out of this and then you're going to go back here and it's going to bring this back up and show you you know for example this um, A17 expansion is assigned to pin 65 so no problem and then once you do that you are going to click uh, compile and it's going to run through the compilation again and it's going to tell you this time how many pins that you um, you know have assigned just like before and how many macro cells the only difference is is that it's compiling the code so that those pins are assigned to a particular pin so this time we got 13 warnings let's see what we got make sure we didn't get anything that broke the system doesn't look like we did so we are not worried about that and that is it we are done as far as how to actually build up this um, CPLD now I could go into a little bit more detail and actually break it out and um, you know get this working on a breadboard or something like that but I'm actually going to save that for a different day and the reason why I'm gonna save that for a different day is because as I mentioned before I have such a day coming up I have a um, computer that is going to use this and we are going to shoot a video on that and we are going to get it out there for you to view however I do not have time to shoot that video and get it ready for upload before the start of the new year and I want to start this series out here in December so that you guys have something to look at over the Christmas break and also because I haven't really had a chance to do many videos here in 2020 because of the crazy virus and the crazy people and the crazy elections and all these crazy everything it's just I'm done with this year and if the calendar rolls over and it says it's the 13th month of 2020 I'm going to lose my mind so trying to get this stuff out there for you guys to be able to view over the holidays um, maybe even play with your own um, you know little schematics and um, CPLDs over the holidays and be able to refer back to my videos so I wanted to give you the opportunity to do that and expect another video coming up at least one probably two or three but with this being the fourth video in the series I think this is going to be enough to get you guys started now there's other videos on how do you actually program your CPLD once you have this done I'll show you that right now you can go up here to um, this little pin right here that says programmer or you can go to tools and it's under tools as well on the drop down menus and it's gonna pop up this little window here and once we have it here we can add a file we're gonna to go to our output files we can actually get rid of that one we only need one of them up here uh, it's gonna ask you for your hardware you are going to want to make sure that your hardware is set up and if it's not you're gonna be in sad shape so let's see if I can get this thing working real quick sometimes this USB blaster works sometimes it doesn't Ah, there we go. All right, so we've got it set up, and uh, we can actually, um, we've already added our file. Whenever we go to do this, we're going to want to program, verify, and blank check. And then you're just simply going to click start. Uh, I don't have a, I don't have one here ready that I can actually upload this to, but trust me you're just going to plug in your JTAG header and then you're going to click start it's going to show you the progress up here once it gets to 100 it'll say 100 percent complete or something to that nature and then you're done and you can exit out of this just click no here unless you do want to save it and then that's it you're done play for or play with it if it doesn't work go back to your code revamp your code it's not really that hard so but 
it's outside the scope of this video that deals more with how to use Quartus and I am dealing more with how to actually um, just put these systems together so that you can use them but I do want to thank you for taking the time to watch the video today I want to thank everyone for staying with me through this series and if you have any questions like I mentioned before I want you to ask them down below or you can even go over to my website and shoot me a email um, I've got a contact form there you'll just have to go into the uh, top menu and it'll take you to the contact us page um, you're welcome to email me there though I always answer um, unless you're a, you know just a robot because I do get robots um, I've got the discord form you can always go there and ask me questions I'm more than happy to answer questions there um, and if you decide that you want to do any projects and you want to you know get my input on it I'm always the one to give you some input or you know what I think could be wrong but obviously it's kind of hard to do that kind of stuff from afar so um, but be willing to give you any type of um, information that I can uh, just general questions you know tell me what you'd like to see next even but like I said I do want to thank you uh, for you know staying with this and checking out the website I hope it helps you um, you know check out the website because there are going to be some LinkedIn files um, with each one of these uh, uh, videos I've got a little blog post I'm doing about each one and just adding a couple files below I can't share Quartus 2 but I will try to uh, post a link to the download page if I can find it um, although I do think that they've taken the Quartus 2 version 13 down maybe they haven't crossing my fingers and if they have then maybe I can find a way to upload it to archive.org maybe that'll save us some but whatever the case um, yeah that's it guys so if you got any questions like I said just drop them below I'll see you next time